program our minds, once we hear a definition of something, and we can limit what the scripture truly opens up to a better understanding of words. And words have reportive meaning. So as I prepared and thought, well, I'm ready to wrap up Galatians, and I thought I need to teach on grace. It is the missing message of today's church. I thought two things. Wow, how could anybody teach one message on grace? Because there's so many dimensions of grace to speak of. And to define grace opens up what I call a real can of worms, because we have been taught grace, reduced down to its simplest definition, is unmerited favor. I did nothing and you did nothing to deserve or merit that which God gives us. But it began to really register with me that that may be too simple, too, not too simple, but too, uh, well, there's just much more to grace. And Peter was right when he said manifold grace, which means many colored grace, like a rainbow, that grace is not limited to, as some have reduced this concept down to a mere attribute of God or some dimension of God in a single tunnel vision realm. In fact, I made a list in a short version somewhere. Oh, right here. It's right in front of me. I made a list of, just in English, how we have used the word grace. Up until the Act of Union in 1707, kings or queens were addressed as your grace. Subjects would come into the presence when summoned of the king or queen, and it would, they would be addressed, the king or queen would be addressed as your grace, which has now subsequently been over time replaced by other things. Now it's your majesty, but it has metamorphosed. It was your grace. Um, you've heard the expression, thank you for gracing us with your presence, yes, which colloquial uh, as it is, but the sense of blessing or bestowing. Um, grace, as in someone who is graceful, movement or beauty. Um, there's even grace in legal terminology, which would be attached to a grace period, where you are not having to make payments under a contract uh, without penalty. There are other coverings of grace. In fact, in, in looking up all the, the uh, grace examples, there were two things that I thought were kind of funny. One was um, a pretty famous musician entitled his album, he's a secular musician, entitled his album Grace. It's funny seeing the nature of the artist. And um, we say, obviously we say grace before meals, but this one was kind of interesting. There's a photograph that was done in 1918 by Eric Enstrom, depicting an elderly man sim sitting at a simple table hands clasped before a simple meal, which suggests that he was about to say grace. But in 2002, an act of the Minnesota State Legislature established this as the state photograph. Grace is the state photograph. So I thought that was kind of an interesting sidebar. But I began to look at grace, how we use it in our street term, how we misunderstand it, how I feel the church at large, by and large, is not doing its part to preach grace, which, if I may, just give you an example of why grace is so important. Don't turn there, because I'm going to move through the Bible in two minutes. But if I were to show you how much, just as a, a, an integral part of the scriptures, Romans opens with, by whom we have received grace and apostleship and grace to you and peace. That's the opening of Romans. And of course, the close of Romans. There in between are sandwiched many examples of grace, but the closing words uh, of this uh, letter, grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. And 1 Corinthians opens with grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. And 1 Corinthians closes with the same thing, same uh, in fact, you can go through the rest of the New Testament and find the opening and closing of the books, 
1 Corinthians 16 and 23, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. 2 Corinthians opens with grace and closes with grace. I think you'll take my word for it. Uh, Galatians and Ephesians and uh, it just goes straight through, in fact, the last word of the New Testament in the book of Revelation, grace to you. And so I think there are several dimensions of this word that should not be limited to a mere salutation. If grace was so important to the New Testament church, the first question one might ask is then why did Jesus out of his own mouth not use the word more? Be a good question, right? Because naturally we say whatever Jesus declared, therefore that makes good New Testament solid doctrine. But he didn't need to speak it, he embodied it. That's the beauty of why Jesus is Jesus and we're not Jesus. And too many people that say, well, you ought to be more like Christ. Well, I can't be because he is God and I'm not. Want me to say that again? <laughs> Never mind. Jesus embodied it when he healed the sick. That's grace. The grace, it is God's nature to heal. We say when we read the scriptures, it says, I'm the Lord that healeth thee. Except it's also God's graceful nature and a dimension of God, and when he, you can just find so many dimensions, but specifically when it comes to salvation, how Jesus went to the tax collector's home. And truly this day salvation has come unto your house. And it was a graceful act. It was an act of grace. Because that's where God meets us. He meets us right where we are, and anyone who preaches, I'm going to recap a little bit of Galatians, anyone who preaches or teaches you that you must be changed to come into the church, that you must change your clothes or the way you look, God is the great changer. He's the one with the power. He stirs the insides and places that deposit of his nature that does the changing. And I can't say that enough. It's God's grace. Now, too many times I'll hear people who preach grace, when they do, and they add a but to it. Grace, but you got to do something. Well, if it's grace, as the Apostle Paul says, if it's grace, then it's all of grace. And if it's works, then it's all of works. But don't try and combine the two because the twain shall never meet. Having said that, I want to read what a giant of the faith, before I get into my teaching on Galatians, I want to read what a giant of the faith uh, says about grace. And I, I can't tell you even where this came from, <laughs> except it is by Charles Spurgeon. So you can look it up if you want to look it up somewhere. This is Charles Spurgeon on himself. He says, how Spurgeon learned of grace by Charles Spurgeon. We give credit any time I read from people's work, so I'm telling you who wrote it. Well, can I remember the manner in which I learned the doctrines of grace in a single instant? Born, as all of us are by nature, an Arminian, I still believed the old things I had heard continually from the pulpit and did not see the grace of God. When I was coming to Christ, I thought I was doing it all myself. And though I sought the Lord earnestly, I had no idea the Lord was seeking me. I do not think the young convert is at first aware of this. That is an absolute true statement. I can recall the very day and hour when I first received these truths in my own soul, when they were, as John Bunyan says, burnt into my heart as with a hot iron. I can recollect how I felt that I had grown all of a sudden from a babe into a man, that I had made progress in scriptural knowledge through having found once and for all the clue to the truth of God. This is the key. One night when I was sitting in the house of God, I was not thinking much about the preacher's sermon. <laughs> I like that for honesty. I was not thinking much about the preacher's sermon, for I did not believe it. <laughs> I like Spurgeon, you know, just say it the way it is. The thought struck me. This is his thought. How did you become a Christian? Well, I sought the Lord. But how did you come to seek the Lord? The truth flashed across my mind in a moment. 
I should not have sought him unless there had been some previous influence in my mind to make me seek him. I prayed, thought I, but I asked myself, how came I to pray? I was induced to pray by reading the scriptures. I did read them, but what led me to do so? Then in a moment, I saw that God was at the bottom of it all and that he was the author of my faith. It was the whole doctrine of grace opening up to me, and from that doctrine I have not departed to this day, and I desire to make it my constant confession. I ascribe my change wholly to God." Now, if Spurgeon could go and ask those very profound questions, and they're, they're very simplistic, but they're very profound, it's tracing back to the first goer to what modern theology has coined prevenient grace. The initiative must start with God. Now, we're not going to talk about how when you get into uh, certain forms of theology and people get hung up with, is it all wound up or does it, is it free will or not free will? That's really single-handedly the greatest, uh, if you want to say, exposition on the, on the topic of grace in somewhat modern times, although Augustine is not very modern, but he, Augustine, that's uh, wash, some 400 years after Christ or whatever the time is, brings to light how free will, the problem of free will, and writes against Pelagius on this very topic of grace. And it's very interesting because the church then wrestles this dragon through church history until the Council of Trent, which basically was the, the 19th church council that basically condemned Martin Luther and the reformers, and the topic of grace was brought to the surface and then immediately shut down. Because how could we let people be saved by grace? Then what would the church do? It would run out of ideas and profit, and where would the money come from if we couldn't get people to invest into springing people from purgatory and other such things that were commonly peddled back in that day? So. Thank God for grace, and thank God for God's Word that reveals such uh, concepts to us. But let's talk a little bit first about grace, and I'm going to speak, I'm speaking out of Galatians. I'm actually going to highlight seven pivotal places in Galatians uh, that mention grace and why they're pivotal. We can read over them very quickly. Uh, Galatians 1.3 is his salutation. The salutation ends, by the way, in five verses in the opening of Galatians. After the salutation is done, we go right to the hammer that's going to get a wake-up call to those at Galatia. But in verse, chapter 1, verse 3, grace, B is italicized, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. And then... I want you to follow down this pattern. That's the first occurrence, and the second one is in the sixth verse, where after the salutation is complete, he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. I took the liberty to go through this and look at the initiative which does start with God of how we are, how we are saved, because just encircling a few words, called you into the grace of God. And he will, Paul will repeat this in verse 15 when he says, When it pleased God, 115, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal in me his son or his son in me. So it's safe to say that when, at least for Paul, we're speaking of how salvation comes to this tent of clay, it is by God's calling. Later in another letter, uh, Romans, the calling and election, but here specifically, he says that you were called, and he speaks of himself, and he says he was called from his mother's womb, and that calling came as an act of grace, the first initiative that started with God. Now, I like, there's likes and dislikes when you study theology. Boatman coined a term saying that grace was an event, and I agree with that only in part. Grace is an event as when God 
extends its grace, but grace is also continuous. That's why we're told in some other letters of the New Testament to grow in grace, because it is a continuous act. So I've given you, so far we're at number three, verse, uh, verses one and six and 15 of the first chapter. And then in chapter two, where as the English reads slightly backwards from the Greek, but when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship. The Greek starts out with saying, when they saw the grace, so it's reversed, and grace takes preeminence in that sentence. The fourth time, speaking of grace, and when they perceived the grace that was given unto me. Now, I read that, and that got me to thinking about some Old Testament concepts. Ever read in the scriptures where it says, early on in the Old Testament, if I found favor or grace in the sight of God, Speaking of Noah first, if I found favor or grace in the sight of God. So it was interesting to me that there are concepts that are carried through the scripture, like to perceive, to see, or to know, which is a throwback from the Old Testament. You can't escape it to have to find favor. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I'm just highlighting the verses to give you a whole gestalt. Uh, 2 and 21, Galatians 2 and 21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And again, he will talk about how if we are trying to go back to the law, in chapter 5 and verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of, who, whoever of you that are justified by the law, you're fallen from grace. So basically, we're called by grace, according to Paul, and we are recipients of his grace. And anyone who is looking to go back to that old way that was nailed to the cross, fallen from grace, you can make a whole gospel of grace through the book of Galatians. And it's quite staggering because the last word ends with brethren. 618, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Seven times. And what is remarkable to me is I began to analyze the examples. And I thought, this is an integral part of our faith. And ideas about what grace is or isn't developed from an erroneous reading or misinterpretation of the scriptures. Now, let me give you a perfect case in point. We've just looked at seven examples of grace within the book of Galatians. And we could say each use of the word could represent unmerited favor, but let me explain why that cannot be a universal definition. Because in one of the Gospels, it is Luke's Gospel, in Luke, where it speaks of Jesus. In Luke's Gospel, in the second chapter and 52nd verse, it says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So, uh, by the way, favor there is grace. It's charis. I should write these words. So, the Greek word, charis or karin, here, charis. And the reason why I said it's, in, it's impossible to limit it to one strict definition is we would therefore be saying that the last possible thought of interpretation is that Jesus did not deserve this favor when in fact God sent his only begotten son. It would, be, it would contradict itself. Do you understand what I'm saying? It cannot be limited to just strictly unmerited favor in that respect. But I put down some different concepts so we can understand that grace, as Peter says, manifold grace, and it is. Grace that occurs, for example, through 1 Corinthians 16 is referring to money. When the scripture says, King James says, your liberality, and some people are more liberal than others. 
2 Corinthians 8, it's referring to money again. In 2 Corinthians 9, it's in the increase of wor worldly goods that's referring to grace. And there's even a concept of grace in 2 Corinthians 1 and 15 that the King James translators, instead of translating grace, they're using the word benefit. When Paul says that it would benefit them for him to come and visit, that essentially, there it is, he would grace them with his presence. We just were reticent to say some of those things. Grace also has present and future connotations attached to it. Uh, in First Peter, it speaks of future heavenly blessings that Christians are to receive. And later on in that same book, it speaks of the gift of present life. And all those are being referred to as graces. Now, in the Old Testament... What we are speaking of today, the modern Greek, karis. In the Old Testament, you start off with a concept called, we'll write it in English here, chen. That's how it sounds. Chen. How you doing? <laughs> that word could denote gracefulness, Favor. It carried with it a, a whole plethora of meanings. As you know, and we've said, the Hebrew is much more vast and ambiguous and can carry many more shades of meanings uh, through words. But grace or favor will first encounter this with Noah. And this is what's remarkable to me. I've never figured this out. And forgive me for asking or saying this because it's, it is rhetorical, but I've never figured this out. I don't think you and I will ever figure this out. We read the whole story of Noah, and it says that Noah found favor in God's eyes. And we also read through the story and find that Noah was obedient and built the ark, but we also read that Noah, you know, he liked to have some hooch because he got drunk, <laughs> and some other things that might have happened that the apocryphal kind of may or may not divulge to us. So. Having said that, God knew what was in the man's heart when he called him. I've never understood this. So when it says he found favor in God's eyes, God already knew what was in the heart of Noah and chose him regardless of what was in his heart. This is the mystery to me of the church. The church is so busy trying to figure out how to get everybody into this holiness mode. And don't think for a minute that I don't believe in what the Scripture declares about sin and holiness. I do. I believe that we all sin. We are all sinners. And I believe holiness simply represents a commitment to something, such as a body like mine or a being or a book, that we, we say is committed wholly to God. That doesn't stop us from breathing. It doesn't stop my carnal mind from operating. Nor does it give me the dispensation to be weak and uh, say, well, there are no consequences, save that I understand in Christ, as I said last week, no more condemnation, no more ultimate condemnation in Christ. But I'll never understand why when people look even to the Old Testament, they don't see that God was showing a design which is being translated as favor in the Old Testament, that God was showing a design perfectly clear that the concept of perfection was non-existent even in the best of creation that he said, go into the ark, you and your family, and go and start over again. So uh, there, are, there are many colors, if you will, of grace. First Peter 4.10, as I said, describes manifold grace, and that is like multicolors of the rainbow. You cannot just describe one color. There are many shades. Now, God knew that because through the Old Testament there's another word being uh, fit into this Greek word from chen, which is the one word. We have another word which is chesed, which is usually being translated unconditional love, loving kindness. These will all ultimately fit into karis. And you'll find something truly amazing that if you're looking to the root of karis, you'll find at its root, I'll write it in English, karain, which is translated joy or happiness. 
attached to grace. But going through these Hebrew words, you discover something. Chen, which is favor, or being translated grace or favor. Chesed, loving kindness. And another word, um, Ratzon, which I think would all fit nicely into this one word for grace, the loving kindness, the unfailing love of God which fits into, into grace, this favor or uh, gracious nature fitting into here, and ratzon as well, another dimension very hard to define. Now I tell you all this because when we come back to the New Testament, when people speak of grace, I've heard people, oh, I might as well, you know, just might as well. I've heard people talk about grace. Some people call their ministries grace. But what is grace then? Because if it begins with God and ends with the last word being grace, then I have to look at what's in between and who's being spoken to and the recipients of this grace. That's the other staggering thing. One of the books I was looking at was out of Romans, uh, some type of definition which I quoted. If it's by grace, it's no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So ultimately, when Paul is speaking to us through Galatians, it becomes abundantly clear that grace is not just some idle word that, uh, you know, he just felt like talking about. It really does embody the whole process of salvation. And I say process because it is an ongoing activity. It is something that is lifelong in the metamorphosed process of a believer. And inescapable as I've shown you through the New Testament. I was reading another, uh, in fact, I brought it. <laughs> I thought I didn't, but I did. Uh, this is the famous Anchor Bible Dictionary. Yes, because I know you're all having withdrawal pains. Let's read a little bit about what it says here. And there's just so much, and they do write in their opening line, it says um, th that the subject of grace in the Old Testament is too vast for comprehensive treatment, and I agree with that. We could not exhaust if you tried to figure out how to treat it concisely, I don't think it's doable. So it makes perfect sense to just put that at the beginning. It's just too vast for a comprehensive treatment. Grace is the favor of God to human beings. Do you know, I find that is the first thing that is misunderstood in churches everywhere. That's an act of God. Uh, equally staggering, when we talk about God's grace, and I'm gonna, I want to read out of this, but equally staggering, and equally difficult for us to accept that God's grace was sufficient enough for you and for me, but God's grace and the sending of His Son to die and pay the penalty for the whole world was also sufficient. This is going to make some people shiver for a Hitler. That just, that just rubs people the wrong way. How could that be? That's just, that's horrible. Well, in Paul's, and I, I hate to use it this way, but in Paul's theology, which is the most brilliant understanding of Old and New Testament ever put down on paper, he understood when you travel through Romans and you read starting at Romans 5 regarding Adam, and then he travels into this first Adam, disobedient, this last Adam came to get victory for us. And traveling through the book of Romans, it makes very clear that for the best or the worst this world has seen, the grace covering sufficient. And from that grace covering, I'm talking about obviously the act at Calvary, the shed blood, and I could go on and on and on speaking of the dimensions of the cross, which we've at least tried to cover in part. So it's very difficult for people to even grasp that. And it is a hard concept. I remember when I first heard Dr. Scott teach on this subject, I thought, ooh, you mean a man who 
slaughtered people and killed people, and he's a recipient of that same grace, of that same yes. Now, whether or not, and this is where people get into the chicken and egg discussion, whether or not this person realized, knew, or whatever, that's not for us to discuss. That's God's problem. But the only issue is Jesus had to come and his sacrifice had to be sufficient enough for every generation through time. You know, we speak a lot about, um, oh, here's a good one for you. The uh, Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Middle Ages, we speak of ages. Paul understood we weren't merely talking about ages as defined by sections of time, but by a whole new way in laying out the fact that this way of grace, this way of faith, this way of peace now paved the way so that Jew and Gentile could be reconciled. As the Ephesian letter says, the wall of partition broken down. But something else, a new way for mankind. Jesus made a new way for us that we're not damned in this body. Otherwise, if Jesus didn't come and stayed as the perfect son, never having the sins laid upon him and never, never dying at the cross. He could have returned to God in perfection, but it wouldn't have saved anybody. And that's the wonder of this concept of grace. He initiated, he started, God designed, and we're the recipients. And how tragic that the church world is still trying to resurrect some formula that we can somehow feel that we are doers of something that will add to. And that's why this word grace should be drilled into the minds of people wherever we go. A sphere of grace, we could talk about. When I navigated through this study, I thought, you know, it's probably something that one person could undertake in a lifetime and not exhaust. I read all the great, because that's my, my responsibility, I read all the great theologians on this doctrine of grace. And man, the, whew, you should just, if, you, if time permitted and you wanted to go to sleep, uh, but the volumes of writing on this subject and single-handedly, the one area where I feel every single theologian will bridge together a single concept is that the initiator is God, which then goes back to, are we worshiping the creature or the creator? Are we trusting the creator? Or do we put our trust more in the creatures around us? So you can see it's, it's self-evident that brings the mindset of saying, if I have complete trust in the Creator, then I trust His Word to be true. And by that trusting Word, I recognize He says, I'm saved, and it is a gift, a free gift, by the way. That's the other wonder of grace. Grace never comes with some, something attached that must be remitted at the end. Grace comes as a gift to us. All right, so back to the dictionary here. Um, and they separate this into two articles, but the first term that should be considered is the root chen, which I wrote for you in the Hebrew. This word, by itself, in its single base use, occurs over 200 times in the Old Testament, just as its base use. 200 times, chen and chanan. Derivatives of the root include the verb chanan, to be gracious, to act graciously, Nouns, and they list the nouns, the verbs 78 times, and so forth. Here's what's interesting, because I thought the same mindset that awoke in me is in this dictionary, and I picked this up only this morning, coming into my office. The noun hen, for grace or favor, occurs 69 times, with frequent occurrences in, in expressions such as to find favor in the eyes of, the idiom find grace or favor in the sight of someone, refers to the positive disposition of the one acting graciously and granting favor. And of course, you can go on to just, I mean, this is a, a pretty big article on, they, they, they will then go on to talk about chesed, 
which is the word, the second word that I gave to you here, and that their definition is not too clear. Uh, the meaning of chesed has been illuminated by in the important studies of several scholars, um, but chesed is an action rather than simply an attitude or psychological state. The act of chesed is based upon and performed in an existing relationship, and we could go on describing this, and I could bore you with that. And ratzen, the, the last one. But all of these three words at least give you an idea that the concepts are put into this, like a, a sock, I guess. Taking these three and putting them into the Greek word karis is like saying, within the grace of God, there must be God's agape. And the reason why I say that, it's kind of funny that the Hebrew includes this word chesed, which is love or loving kindness, one of the few words in the Hebrew for love or loving kindness, put into grace. And here's where the uh, evangelists come out and say, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful. No, I didn't say that. Somebody else did. And don't see that that act of love had to have two conditions attached to it. One, that God had the ultimate power to raise up his son from the dead, and that it was undeserved. There was no merit in man to deserve God sending his son. There was no, the scripture's clear, there's no righteous, no not one, we're all as filthy rags. So the difficulty that I had in picking through this was I recognized in Paul's writing, he uses grace as a beginning and as an end. He uses grace not just as a salutation and a benediction, but he also uses grace and the words, the caris words, to describe how men and women are called, as in the Ephesian letter, called out, called out ones by grace. That gripped me. And I went back, in fact, to reread Spurgeon's How He Came to the Faith, How He Came to Understand Grace. That ultimately, behind everything, there had to be an initiative that started with God. And I had the free will, just like you did, to not respond. Another missing message of the church, if we just stop telling people we can save the world, which is the other heresy. How many of you heard that, that people believe that they can save the whole world, they're going to save the planet, everybody's going to get saved? There's only one problem with that. I do have a problem with that. Having read the whole book, and even coming to the end of the book, we know perfectly well there are, if the church is removed, as Revelation has been interpreted, if the church is removed and the remnant that is left... Uh, not every single person will be saved. And that's designed clearly to say that God's grace bought the whole world, but by God's own word and his writer, there's going to be people being picked off, bodies being picked up off the street and being burned somewhere. Sorry, that's what the scripture says. And please don't go and say, well, better, we better go evangelize those people right now. <laughs> that's like telling a kid to eat their peas and carrots. Never mind. My point is, we have this calling from God. I started at describing when he's giving his salutation and goes into this, uh, let's go back to 1.6 for a minute, when he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. You were called and I called into the grace of Christ. And if we're not surely certain about this, he says God called him by grace as well. Now, we've talked much over the years about prevenient grace and about the call of God, but this is why if we're truly rightly dividing the scriptures, scales have to fall from the eyes of people to recognize I cannot save you. I cannot deliver you. I cannot do it for you. It's God's initiative. 
He starts with before the worlds were formed. And please don't say, well, are you going to tell me you're a predestinarian or do you believe in election that's just all wound up? Don't ask me. I haven't even solved the mysteries of today, let alone that one, which to me is like the Rubik's Cube of Scripture. Too many people spend too much time just twisting around. There's <laughs> twist on it. But my point is that too much time is spent on debating these topics rather than looking at and understanding how God calls us into the grace of Christ. We are called into the grace. Paul says, speaking that he was called into the grace. And I cannot emphasize this enough because once this is chiseled away and made clear, I can then say better understanding will come specifically to those people who are young in the faith that grace should be understood as ultimately the gift of God, ultimately as that which is poured out onto me both in the dimension of my calling, which is the awakening of when I was dead in trespasses and sins, and as I walk, because as I remain in faith, I remain in a sphere of grace. Now, having said all of that, as I was combing through Paul's words, Paul's writings, I thought to myself, what an interesting thing. When he tells people, specifically at Galatia, not only were you called into the grace of Christ, but if you're looking for some other way to walk with God and you go back to the law, he says, you're fallen from grace. So not only are you called, and he uses the word, caliso, called, if you are taking what he's saying exactly the way it appears, but to those who seek to do their own way, salvation, Jesus Christ, plus, as I described the other week, and have all these add-ons, he says, you are fallen from grace. And I like, it's just interesting notes here, simple but interesting notes. He doesn't say, you're fallen from faith, because early on he says, after that faith is come, one of these verses. He says, after that faith has come, then you're no longer under the law. So he doesn't say you're fallen from faith. He says you're fallen from grace. And think about it. If God calls us and chooses us by his grace, then the minute we are seeking to reach for another means or mode of salvation, we have disconnected the sphere that brought us and called us into that glorious place to begin with. Closing the book, and he comes to the last uh, verse of the book, which was, there was no verse, it was just a letter that he had penned, and he says, Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And I thought, strangely enough, the book opens with and closes with grace. Keep in mind, he is writing to a church that has been overtaken or has been contaminated by people coming in and preaching something other than Jesus Christ. We talked last week about circumcision and why the mentioning and the last words should be that of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the calling, the same way that we were found, is the same way that we will end if we remain the house of faith. Can't be said enough. The most basic message of the church that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He doesn't say that you might stay in the sphere of grace, but be with your spirit. Now, pretty simple, basic, basic, but here's the interesting thing. In just looking at Galatia, if I just had that single letter and it stood alone, I could navigate through the calling of God and how God chooses his mouthpieces as he chose Paul and chose the church, those that were called to receive, how understanding if we are seeking to provide another way that we're frustrating the grace of God, we're, we are irritating or agitating God's plan, that looking if we are indeed calling ourselves Christians, those who are following Christ and are outside of that realm, then he says you're fallen from grace and closes the letter with Grace be with your spirit. Amen.
just as an individual slice of the New Testament, I have to conclude that grace is not only an integral part of the Christian life, but of every single letter that Paul wrote, which consisted of the preaching and telling of the good news of Jesus Christ, and that the recipients would walk in that sphere, that grace, that unmerited gift that God gave. I don't deserve anything. I didn't, what did I do or what did you do to deserve that Christ should go to the cross and die? But he did it. So, all of this wondrous journey through Galatians brought me to look at all of Paul's writing, everything that he wrote about grace. And strangely enough, it's everywhere. Now, as I said, as I opened, my opening remarks were that some would say, well, but Jesus didn't speak much about grace, but no, he was the living grace. He was the action of grace and the display of grace. And it took Paul to herald up the banner of showing us and telling us what this grace can and does do in our lives. And with the understanding, at least by Peter's word, manifold, I'm looking at a rainbow of different colors that are my banner around me of God's grace. Something really just, it, it just struck me. I thought, what a simple message. And yet, I don't hear people preaching on grace. I went to a pretty popular minister's website because this person tends to be what I'd call the voice of probably fundamentalism or legalism today. Just, I want to see, is there any grace being preached there? Well, you know the answer, don't you? That's like uh, going to try and look for bright daylight in the darkest corner of the earth. No grace there. And that's the, that's the tragedy, that there are yet so many people out there proclaiming, preaching, and teaching, but the message of the church, grace, that grace contains, by the way, it's, it's never articulated as, a, as such, but that grace contains in it, if I were taking the word and putting it up like a covering, it contains forgiveness of sins, it contains healing, it contains everything that God is and can and will be to us with the, with the mindset, I don't deserve it, but he's doing it for me. Now, all of this segue brings me to one funny story, which I must tell you. As I was looking through, it dawned on me that very few people preached grace. And the reason why, it's very simple. Because grace opens the door. If grace is not taught, it's like a balanced diet. If grace is not preached and taught amongst all of the full message of the Bible, people, I guess ministers who may be insecure, in the ability of God to keep you and guide you, will say, well, if we preach grace, that means that sin will abound, forgetting and laying aside Romans 6. Just herald the argument, if we preach grace, then sin will abound. And the Apostle Paul says, God forbid. Uh-uh. That was the argument of those antinomianism people that said, just if you preach grace, people will just sin all the more. No. If you preach grace and you preach grace, with an understanding of what happened at the cross, there's something to be said about the power of God, not the power of an individual, but the power of God. And suddenly, you recognize why grace is not preached. That would mean we'd have to trust God implicitly. Isn't that a novel concept? We'd have to trust God implicitly. We'd have to trust and believe that God is the God who he has claimed to be through Scripture, that when he said and made certain promises that he would, we have to trust God implicitly and walk in an invisible sphere with no, no circumcision being displayed, and that can be any form, not just what you think or what you might be thinking, but any form of what may be displayed as an apparent, evident, uh, that's proof that the person is saved by golly gee, if they walk a certain way and talk a certain way, they've got to be saved. So, I only found one person who delivered a message of grace that at least fit into my framework. And 
the interesting thing is that Dr. Scott's first message here, VF1, was the last words from Paul, Peter, and John. That was in, I think the date is on here, November 9th, 1975. But because I'm slightly prejudiced, and I always will go back to the things that I see or know, I actually found probably inspiration for that sermon that was preached in 1916 by a young preacher back then by the name of G. Campbell Morgan. And December 29th, 1916, the final words from Peter, Paul, and John. Uh, basically, and it's the, last, it's the final words of the last book. This is kind of an old, old-timey, uh, 1916 would be this volume right here. But let me just give you a synopsis because it's basically these are pretty much the same in their essence. No need for me to read it verbatim. These great men of the faith, in spite of the perils that they went through, in spite of their lessons, in spite of all that befell them, it's interesting to note that their last and final words were grace. Grace be to you from Peter's mouth, from Paul's mouth out of 2 Timothy, Peter, his last words, grow in grace, and John's last words on the Isle of Patmos, the grace of God be with you. Interesting that these men, in their final writings, did not have any idea whether or not death would be tomorrow or day after tomorrow or a week or a month. They all knew that it was uh, on the horizon. But the last word that calmed each man's spirit and let them stand by faith, their last words were grace and peace, but grace to you. And specifically, the one that stuck out in my mind the most as the, the heralder wouldn't actually be Paul or Peter, but John. And the reason why I say that is this man who was basically by himself and exiled, and his last words that he could say, not knowing his future, Paul, we know he said, the time of my departure is at hand. He knew the end was near. Peter, I'm sure even he knew the end was near. John's the only one, by the way, that doesn't get uh, crucified or executed like the other, all the other men did. He lived out his life until, uh, we believe, the late 90s. But in any event, the one that's the most staggering to me is John. When he's last words to the people, grace to you. And I started there with putting that on the board, and I end with that. We should take uh, confidence that too much of what happens today is based on what we can see. And certainly for the Apostle Paul writing, or Peter, or John, and as you take the time to look through your Bibles, you'll find that grace is an integral part of the Scriptures and it is preached both at the beginning, the middle, and the end. And the common factor, whether Paul was writing from a prison cell and saying, grace be to you, can you imagine that? It, the thought doesn't even carry as much horror as if I envision Paul in this underground, hewn prison writing in his final letter is peace, grace and peace to you. That's staggering. To leave the last words, not, oh, pray, please pray for my soul that I, I might not have pain. Or you would think the carnal man and the carnal mind would, would heap on something for me, but instead he says, just this grace, or grace and peace, or grow in grace from whatever scriptures I've referenced. And I think that's what I want to make clear for us as a church. Grace encompasses all the things I've declared. It is the initiative that starts with God, but guess what? It's also the concept that no matter what's going on, the uncertainty of tomorrow, God already knows. And by the way, if we're trusting completely in Him, provides a way for us in His grace. You know, we talk much about faith, and we tell people, oh, yeah, here's the life of faith, and we have peace with God because He's no longer against us and we're not fighting His plan anymore, at least most of us, some of us maybe. But grace, 
the final word. So I would just leave you with the final words from Galatia. As he says, brother, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, be with your spirit. For those of us, and I raise my hand first, who seem to encounter trouble at every impasse, just seems to follow me around. And I'm talking about the same spirit that was at Galatia, those people who could just not accept and understand and say, Jesus paid the price. I should have died, but he died in my place, and just take it and walk in the knowledge. A complete work has been done. I faith in him, and I'm a recipient of his grace, not knowing what tomorrow will bring. But just like the song we used to sing, I don't know about tomorrow, but I'm trusting in him. I know that as I walk and as I go, he is with me. And that same grace that Paul spoke of, that Peter and John spoke of, I speak to you today. Called into the kingdom by his grace, we are connected in faith, and grace is the closing remark from Paul that says, no matter what's going on, grace be with your spirit. Walk in that knowledge that his invisible presence and that sphere we're in is sufficient enough, unmerited, and if we'll keep the mindset that says, I did nothing to deserve this, the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving, which, by the way, is cloaked in the New Testament. We seldom read of that word. Thanksgiving, the Eucharist, and there's another word for thanksgiving, by the way, that's cloaked inside the New Testament. We never hear of it because we read it differently. The King James used another word, but grace is also the thanks. When it says thanks be to God, thanks to Jesus our Lord and Savior, that is the caris word, the grace word. Even in giving a response to him, I cannot even understand what he's done for me, but the heart that is welled up with gratefulness says, thank you, Lord, the spirit of grace operating in my life the gift that he gives to me, and I walk in it, and I pray you walk in it boldly. And as the Apostle Paul has told us, henceforth, let no man trouble you or me, bearing about in our body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren and sistern, because we've got a whole family in our midst, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And put a big period at the end of that and say, if that's Paul's message, and it it was sufficient for the Church of Galatia. It is sufficient for this church today. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www dot pastor melissa scott dot com